what we're doing here today is we're attempting to very accurately recreate uh, the sound of Stuart Copeland from The Police in the middle of the Police albums, which is Zenyatta Mondata and Ghost in the Machine. So, this is Zenyatta Mondata. It's the first record I got. I got it on vinyl. I was going to bring the vinyl to show you, but I forgot to bring it, but I do have the CD. Everyone has an affection for their first record. But the drum sound on it is amazing. Stuart Copeland is just the best pop drummer anywhere. He just makes a track. And the sound on those records is quite unique. It's sort of post-punk and post-disco, and it's got the energy of punk, and it's got the danceability of disco, but it doesn't really sound like anything that anyone else was doing. It's this very personal sound. In part, I'm just doing it out of love. Uh, it's just something I've always wanted to do. It's just like, oh, how can we get this exactly the same? How does he hold the sticks? What, what's the snare drum? What's the snare drum head? What's the mics? You know, just get everything the same because it's an amazing sound. I'm sort of notionally making a Young Punks album as well. Come to this working methodology that if the drums are right for dance music, if the drums are right, you know, there's only so much you can do to get it wrong from that point. So if you get a really good drum sound, that isn't the one that everyone else is using. A lot of producers are chasing the sound of what's in, what the A&R men like and so on. But I'm going totally the opposite way. Like I haven't heard this on a record since I was a child. And so that for me is the exciting bit, is no one else is doing it and I love it. And that's the reason to do it. One of the, the drums in the sound palette on the album is this one that I think is really good and means a lot to me. Well, the other thing is musicians love doing this stuff. So yeah, we've, we've got so we've got a Tama drum kit, um, uh, I've bought the Stuart Copeland uh, signature snare, hi-hat and drumsticks. We've got the Octobarn toms, which are a ridiculous thing that almost only Stuart Copeland has ever played. And so then we've had to research all the miking. It's a very specific point. The early police records were really trashy and punky. And by synchronicity, it was very processed and it's a great pop album. I'm looking at sort of the hole in the middle of their career where people know about three hits but don't it's not really well known as a whole body of work where it's sort of this experimental post-disco kind of thing and I'm, I'm always aiming at the least famous bit because it's the bit that's least exposed and there's a couple of these tracks voices inside my head on Zenyatta Mondata and it's really just a studio jam on one chord but it was one where the vibe was really good and it's turned into sort of a, you know, a Beatha underground classic of doing a re-edit of it. And it was never designed as dance music. It was never designed as disco. It was, nobody knew about it. house music coming. And yet as the sun sets on the terrace, at, you know, in Ibiza, you can put that track on because it's just a groove that's danceable. I think that's the unique thing about this part of the police's repertoire is they're not really a dance act apart from in this zone. There's a few moments where it's like, yeah, I can, I can nod my head to that. I'd like it either where it's nearer, where it's like it's really clear, it's like, oh, you've taken that sample and you've recontextualized it. That's what, you know, this re edit's all about. It's like, if you play the whole track, people wouldn't dance. But if you play those four bars, add a kick drum in the bass line, people will dance. People know you've sampled that thing, you've just framed it in a way where people will dance. Or push through to the other side where we end up making totally original music, but, you know, I'm, I'm framing it with like sounds I like that mean something to me that have, are, are fresh and exciting to me and not have that middle zone of, oh, it's, it's a, a, an obvious pastiche of that one song. But I might end up with an obvious pastiche of that one song, like that could happen as well. But this is all right there from the beginning of the Young Punks. It's the first track on the first Young Punks album, Wake Up, Make Up, Bring It Up, Shake Up, is a, a, cl a cleared police sample, though with me and Alex and Guthrie playing it. So we've got a sort of bit of police history, but that was more the punky end of it. I mean, so much of the playing is about getting into character. And if you watch Stuart Copeland's playing, he's a very unique player. And you know, the mo Alex is a brilliant drummer. The most we can hope to do is an obvious pastiche, you know, a sort of uh, a fond homage. And it is no one can play with him because of the physicality of it. Watch the, the way he holds his stick is like, in, and then he brings his hand up here and hits the snare like that. And it doesn't sound right unless you do that. And I tried doing it and I hit myself in the head. And I've never hit myself in the head whilst playing the drums before. But how, you know, everything is about getting into, there's a supreme confidence to uh, Stuart Copeland's playing. 
it's a total commitment and you know the fact that he wants to wear tennis clothes while he's doing it is part of that is like fuck you we've been firing emails between each other for a while at lots of uh, you know finding information on the internet which is obviously by default incorrect um, <laughs> and trying to work out exactly what drums exactly what heads exactly what tuning exactly what sticks exactly what microphones exactly what make techniques exactly what preamps exactly what reverb um, and it seems to be working We're about does. a couple of hours in yeah um, the fundaments we've got here is Tama drum kit octobands as additional snares pasty symbols features of very small splash symbols and we've managed to get our hands on Stuart Copeland's actual um, uh, signature draw, uh, snare drum, drumsticks and hi-hats. So we've got the core of the sound there and then you've got to tune it ridiculously tightly and then hit it ridiculously hard. Um, in terms of miking, what have we ended up with, Marco? So we've ended up with a, a pair of condensers on overheads, a pair of U89s, which are a little bit like a more hi-fi U87. They won't have been used on the original session, but it's close to what we thought it should sound like. There's sort of a certain amount of doing uh, analysis of what people say was used, and then there's a certain amount of if it sounds right, it is right Exactly, well. yeah. So we've been sort of A-being the original tracks. Hal managed to get hold of some multi-tracks, so we've been listening to them. Um, so there's quite, a, there's quite a lot of air and breath on the kit, but it sounds like the close mics are pushed up quite high. But also, it sounds like the kick and snare are gated as well. So they're quite tight and immediate and punchy. So we've gone with um, a D12 on kick with a FET 47 on the outside. Pair of um, 57s on the snare. The kick is being gated with uh, a Valley Dynamite. Um, toms, we've gone for mainly condensers because we want that sort of real immediacy and attack. <clears throat> all, so, of, all of Copeland's stuff is about immediacy of impact. Small absolutely. things, tight, um, hit it, it immediately happens. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we've sort of tried to keep the kit, uh, uh, even under all these toms, we've tried to keep it sounding as short as possible. Um, and then we've added a bit of Lexicon 480 with a kind of big, quite a bright sounding mm. room, which when we isolated the, the multi-tracks, you can hear it on there and it just adds... Mm that sort of sound from, from that era, really, doesn't and, it? And the two album periods we're looking at is the sort of centre of the police, is Zenyatta Mondata and Ghost in the Machine. Yeah. And the, the drum, the actual drum sound is about the same, but Hugh Padgham comes into the mix. It's on, a different sonic. The yeah. top end's slightly different, isn't it? Um, and, and also there's, well, they're starting to introduce that sort of room, on yeah. the second album, that room mics gated thing that became more well-known for Phil Collins. Yeah. But it, 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 that, that technique's starting to bleed in more on the second Definitely. record. But still, it's all about... You're just going to go and hit that snare drum. It's like... I mean, it's, it's mainly all about the kick and snare and getting the character of those through. And it's quite a pingy high snare. But you you kind of want it to be short and have an immediacy to it as well. So There's nothing like this. Just go on, go on, go on. Go on, hit it, hit it, hit it. That's all work done right there. Yeah. I mean, I've just put out a pair of 4006s, DPAs. To be honest, I'm blending in a tiny little bit of it because it's not really a roomy sound. Not, is it? Uh, it's the room sort of added <clears throat> artificially. I mean, they're, again, they're just adding a little bit of breath on the kit. Uh, this Myrinx I put out just to try. This is a Pearl mic built into it, so it's quite clean sounding. But if I'm really honest, I'm not actually using it. So it's just like <laughs> yeah. it looks good. Um, but again, because we're not even, I mean, we're trying to get as close to the sound as possible, but obviously we're using these Mapex toms, which aren't part of the original setup. They sound um, closer than the... the, the well, they, they sound, sound really, yeah, they without, sound really without. close. They're quite brash and, and bright, and they yeah. don't really have a huge amount of resonance to go for it. More in what we're getting here is because we've got these clear heads as well. And you're getting yeah, that, I think that so. real sort of slappy attack, which is really nice. And I've always wanted to use the octobands because they're all over the police and yeah. almost not found anywhere else. And you give it a little octoban -y. So the octobands are the weirdest. But 
that's 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 just so policey and, and nothing else. I've always wanted to use them, so that's good. On the desk side, I mean, a lot of no. this stuff is um, uh, Air Montserrat, which is yeah. like my, the, my favourite desk ever for my favourite albums ever. Yeah. So this is it is a vintage. Neve, this is a vintage. Neve, the, one, the Montserrat it? It was a class A Neve. This is a class A B. You get a little bit more front on this. It's less sort of smooth sounding. It's a different period. Mm. Obviously, it's this desk's probably about eight years before the Montserrat one. But it's Something not like super, super driven, is it? So it's not. It's it's quite clean. It seems We're about it. right. Yeah, it, it does. It does. The desk does exactly what you want it to do. The top end's very similar, I think. <laughs> when you, I'm, I'm adding quite a bit of top end because it doesn't want to sound too soft. So it, it's a really yeah. interesting drum sound, where. <sighs> It's just nothing like it. I mean, Stuart Copeland always comes in these high tones that cut over the top of the yeah. mix, which is why I think it'll be interesting in dance because it leaves room for the for the sort of electric sub bass beneath it, and yeah. we're putting an eight oh eight under it or something like that that yeah. they would never have done. But the space is there. You, Sting used to have these massive low ends with you know you play a double bass and a Steinberger yeah. or or P bass, and people don't really notice what's going on. He's got his um, iconic bass lines multi tracked up with really fat basses, yeah. and so that's the way the band works. At the, Pieces, you know, you've got this powerhouse of the drums at the top, rock solid bass down the bottom, yeah. and Andy Summers floats around the side with these glassy, chorusy things, and it's a perfect example of three musicians that didn't really get on or anything, but their three sounds <laughs> just totally complement each other rather than competing. They're Definitely. never treading on each other's toes. They're doing totally different things. It looks <laughs> great, doesn't it? Was it the thing? Is a Stuart Copeland thing of taking a. Uh, a rock and roll standard thing and then just twisting it till it's totally wrong so one thing is you know fills go from top to bottom that's a yeah. digga, 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 digga. so if, but if you hear going into the chorus and wrapped around your finger it's boom, 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 ka, goes from bottom up to top so going backwards through the toms is a quite a Copeland thing or or the whole basis of funk around like Bootsy Collins and everything is all around the one <coughs> Uh, you've got, everything goes on the one, so Stuart Copeland's will just miss the one. Ding, 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 <coughs> and like there's nothing. There's a gaping hole that you fall. It's like a trap door in the music, where normally it would be the rock that holds it together. Everything has to be straight, but you have a cross rhythm going through it, which you should only get in jazz, and you put it into a top ten pop record. Mm -hmm. So all these like subversions are really cool things to put in. I, I listened to The Police a lot, when, especially when I was a kid. It had that kind of like, it was pop, but it had a bit of a punky element to it. It was exciting. The drumming for me, when I was just learning, was, was unique and um, had such a voice to it that it really captured it really captured my ear. So I do love Stuart Copeland's playing. And I do, I do feel like a total charlatan <laughs> trying to emulate him. What, what, and if you are watching this, Stuart, uh, which you won't be. But I'm very sorry if I uh, if I don't sound but anything like you, even though I'm trying. It's interesting. Got two messages here. Or one, the reason we really like Stuart Copeland is he's got a very specific personal voice, and the most important thing as an artist you can have is a very specific personal voice. <laughs> and then what we're doing is is mimicking someone else. But ironically, that's my personal voice as an artist is to go after amazing things that have fallen by the wayside and say, no, let's bring that thing back in, but just use it a different way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, my, my voice is a magpie voice. So I'm, I'm happy to, to, to go with that. Fill your nest with Stuart Copeland's yeah. wares. <laughs> if you think about jungle, you take these Absolutely. fat sounds and they pitch them up yep. till they're very thin, which leaves room for the bass to go underneath. Absolutely. And that's what this is all about, is the drums are up here, so the bass has room to go in. Definitely. And it's, it's just a, a different way to space things out. 100%. Also, I think I think we need to return to this thing of, of playing loud because he is just the loudest drummer. And normally, the lesson I, I would have people take away is that is drummers often underestimate how good it sounds when they play quietly. Absolutely. And a lot yeah. of the tracks, the, the seminal rock tracks with big sounds, are, even by crazy drummers like Keith Moon, you look at their body language, they're, they're barely touching the thing. Well, you, you often want the kit to, to kind of ring out a little bit more and have more definition. When you really spank it, you lose, you lose some of the quality of the drum. Definitely. Uh, so usually when we're doing stuff that's kind of 70s era, yeah. we try to, to keep it really quite laid back, don't yeah. we? And the kit can sing a bit more. But it's not. It's quite a choked sound, this, isn't it? Um, we did a so. session for, for this, also for the same project yeah. a couple of weeks ago, and we, which was... We, we were going quieter, quieter. It sounds better the quieter it is. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just a total contrast. But also another thing I'm doing is I'm recording drum patterns in 
different miking styles with different kits played differently and then actually I'm finding you can you know a lot of breakbeat based music going back particularly through hip hop um, you know you'll play multiple drum beats at the same time you'll have you know a drum machine and two two vintage breakbeat samples all playing at the same time and it all layers up and if you've got totally different approaches within the kits yep. that enables you to do that so I am absolutely going to be layering the drums we recorded last time where I told them to play quiet and make it fat with the drums we do this time where I told them to play it loud and hit, hit you know everything's tuned high and they'll sit in different places in the mix at that yep. point rather than competing yeah so if the pendulum went over there, now I'm taking it back to this side. And what may well happen is I make something, and everyone was into that, but no one likes this. But at least we'll have had fun doing it, and I'll have seen um, Alex wearing tennis gear, which I think everyone's keen to see. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it, and subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Every time we come to it,